Howdy, Canvas. How are we? Doing good? Good to see you. I, uh, it's good to be back. Man, I've been here a bunch of times. I love this church. You guys, it's just so good to be back. Uh, if you got your Bibles, I hope you do. John chapter 3 is where we are going to be, and we're going to be in one of the most famous passages uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Ultimately, we're going to get to John 3.16, which is a very popular passage, especially in these parts. I don't know if you know this, but uh, several years ago, your very own Timmy Tebow put John 3.16 on his eye black when he was playing in a national championship against uh, Oklahoma. I, I forget who he played for, but anyway, during that time, <clears throat> by the way, I did wear my colors just to, so you would see, but during that time while he was, hey man, my Bible's written in red and black, that's all I'm saying. Anyway, <laughs> during that national championship game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16 to see what that was all about. Three years later, when he was playing for the Denver Broncos, on the exact same day, three years later, he was playing in a playoff game, and they were playing against the Steelers, which nobody can like the Steelers, not if you're a believer. <laughs> My Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Don't read your Bible, people. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> and during that same game, at, at the end of it, when they won, he threw an 80-yard pass. Actually, it was like a 10-yard pass, but the man ran for 90 yards. But you get all of the, you get, it's kind of gospel-esque. You get credit for it all. At the end of that game, after they had won, and they were getting ready to go play probably the Patriots, his PR guy for the team, for the Broncos, ran up to him and said, do you understand what just happened? And Timmy was like, yeah, man, we just won the game and we've got to get ready for next week. And they said, no, 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 what just happened when you came into this game is that you threw for 316 yards. Your, rush, your yards per rush were 3.16 yards. Your yards per completion were 31.6. The ratings for the game on CBS was 31.6. The time of possession for the Steelers was 31 minutes and 6 seconds. And during this game, another 94 million people Googled John 3.16. Isn't that a coincidence? And Tebow responded with, you call it a coincidence, I call it a big God. Amen? Amen. Now... We ain't here to talk about football, although we got some stuff to talk about in Jacksonville finally, praise God, all right? But I don't have time, you're going to get me distracted. We're here to talk about what it means to be born again. John chapter 3, we're going to pick it up in verse 1, and y'all got to listen fast, okay? Because I got a lot to cover in a little bit of time. The Bible says this, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now the Pharisees were the super religious people. Pharisee means separated ones. And what the Pharisees would do is they would study the scriptures and they would make up laws about the laws so that when the Messiah came on the scene, they would be the very first one to meet him and know who he is. And so not only did they memorize the 613 laws in the Old Covenant, but they made up new laws to just stay far enough away from them so you didn't break the actual laws. This guy is like a professional do-gooder. This is who Nicodemus is. And so there was a man of the Pharisees, a religious person named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man, this man came to Jesus by night. This is where we get Nick at night. I don't think that's true, but you'll remember it now, right? You'll be like, oh yeah, Nicodemus came at night. And he said to him, Rabbi, so this is a, this is a term of respect. He's not anti-Jesus. He's, he's got questions. <clears throat> and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And he's close, but Jesus was not just a man who's come from God. Jesus is God. And so what Jesus is going to do is Jesus is going to just jump right to the point. I love this. Notice what it says in verse 3. Jesus answered him. Now, look at the Bible. We're doing Bible study. Has Nicodemus even asked a question yet? Nicodemus just walks up and goes, hey, man, I think you're a teacher from God. And Jesus is just going to jump to, to his point. He's going to jump to what he wants Nicodemus to understand. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you were born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's like, man, I, I am not merely a rabbi from God. I am God. I am not merely a teacher that talks about God, but I am the second person of the Trinity. I am not here to just unpack the word for you, but I am the word who has become flesh and dwelt among you. I'm not here to just tell you how to sacrifice the lamb. I am the lamb of God who's come to die on the cross for the salvation of anyone who, be, who would believe. He jumps right to it. And so with that in mind, I just want to jump right to it. My goal today is that when I finish up here in about two or three hours, that, 
I'll never get invited back, but it'd be a doozy, wouldn't it? That, that some of you would be born again. Because here's what's going on with Nicodemus. And here's what, here's what scares me about a church like Canvas, okay? Man, the leadership at your church, the preaching at your church, the music at your church is so phenomenal. I mean, it is so phenomenal, all right? And then not only that, man, Canvas Church is cool. It's just cool. Like, the, the, all the stuff and the lobby and the shirts and the people and the orange and the axe throwing and motorcycle, all that stuff, okay? And I know, I know your pastor points to the gospel over and over and over and over. But sometimes the music can be so good and the communication be so dynamic that people can be around in the very presence of God and miss Jesus. Nicodemus, he's two feet away from God in the flesh. He can smell the breath of God and he doesn't recognize him for who he is. And so Jesus wants him to know, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, and again, here's what he's saying to Nicodemus. This is a good religious guy. This is a guy that grew up in church. He knows his Bible. He's memorized all of the Old Covenant. And what he's saying is this. Look, Nicodemus, you're not like three quarters of the way there. That you, just like everybody else, you have to be born again. Die to yourself and be reborn in me. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> This is going to just fly right over Nicodemus' head. He has no idea what Jesus is talking about. By the way, have you ever been in church or in Bible study reading your Bible and, and you get a little confused? Anybody a little slow on the uptake sometimes? You know, you're like, I don't know what that means. I got real good news. You can make a great disciple. Because this guy has no idea what Jesus is talking about. L look how he responds. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? To which Jesus is like, bro, stop. What are you talking about? <laughs> no. Who? What? Stop. He has no idea. You see, what Jesus is actually saying is, until you die to yourself and are reborn in me, you have no eternal life. That whoever is born once will die twice, both physically and spiritually. But if you were born twice, born physically and reborn by surrendering your life to the Lordship of Christ, that you will only die physically and live an eternal life in the presence of God. And again, this just zooms right over his head. He says, so Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And again, I think Nicodemus is looking at him, and he's like, are you talking to me? Because I don't understand what you're talking about. At first, you're talking about like me being born again. I don't think my mom's going to be into that. She had struggled when I was eight pounds. Now I'm like 220. That's going to be weird, okay? And now you're talking about the wind blowing. Are we having the same conversation here? So Nicodemus says to him, how can these things be? I mean, he has no idea what he's talking about here. In verse 10, and Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. To which Nicodemus is like, no. Now see, here's what I think is going on. This guy is PhD level Old Testament scholar. And so the moment Jesus meets with him, he goes right to top shelf theology. This is what it takes for a man to have eternal life. And it goes zoom, over his head two times. And so Jesus says, hey man, I, I thought you were into this. I thought you were a teacher of God's word. And you don't understand what I'm talking about? He goes on to say this, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. To which I think Nicodemus is like, is there somebody with you? What do you mean we? Because what Jesus is talking about is the cosmic we. The great I am, one God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And out of an overflow of God's love for God's self, he created image bearers. Every human being is an image bearer of God, created to be in that same kind of love relationship that God himself is. This is what Jesus is talking about. Now, this would be blasphemy for Jesus to claim equality with God unless it's true. And then he goes on to say this, if I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is a really, really big deal. 
What Jesus is saying is this. Basically, he's saying, listen, <clears throat> Nicodemus, every other worldview, every other religious ideology on the planet has this in common. We all agree something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. But everybody else's answer to how we get to heaven is that we must ascend the mountain to the top of the mountain. And the uniqueness of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is that Jesus is not on top of the mountain beckoning us by our own behavior to climb our way up to the top, but he comes on a rescue mission. He comes from the top to the bottom to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. What every other worldview, secular, atheist, major world religion, cult, every worldview is this. If you could just be a better version of you, then you can have a right relationship with God. But the good news of the gospel is not, you were bad, God is good, try harder, see you next week. It's not. It's that Jesus came on a rescue mission to seek and to save the lost. And so what Jesus is saying is, you thought that you would see the Messiah because you're a great rule keeper, but I'm here to tell you, you're going to see the Messiah because I'm a great promise keeper. That's the difference. He's saying that you thought it was predicated on behavior. It's not. It's rooted in belief. You thought it was built on religious activity, but it's not. It's a rescue mission that leads to a relationship with him. And now what I think Jesus is going to do, because he's been over Nicodemus' head twice now, is now what he's going to do is he's going to use the schooling that Nicodemus grew up in, which is the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Nicodemus grew up in a school. In order to be a, in order to be a, a Pharisee, you would have to memorize all of the Old Testament, every word of it. And so what he's going to do now is he's going to use two rabbinical tricks, all right? So a, a, a little, a little um, theological jujitsu to get his head around what he's trying to, to get him to understand. So the first one he uses is this. He says this in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now the moment he tells him this, Nicodemus is an expert in Numbers chapter 21. He knows the event that Jesus is talking about. This, this rabbinical trick is called a remez. Say remez. It, means, it literally in Hebrew means hint. So what they would do is one rabbi would just give you a couple of verses from an event in the Old Testament, and then everybody knew everything else that was going there. You guys could do the same thing, okay? Like if I wanted to know who my people were, that grew up in the 90s with me, I could simply do this. Regulators. All right, that's my people. Anybody, anybody that said mount up, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're like, mount, where are we mounting? Is it Father's Day already? Then you're not my people, okay? You just don't know the sliver I grew up in, all right? Or we could divide the room this way. If I just go ding, 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 ding. All right, if you're older than me, you're going to feel pressure. And if you're my age, you're going to stop, collaborate, and listen. That's just how it works, man. And if you don't know that song because you're young and I don't know your songs, it's because your songs are terrible. That's why, okay? So that's just true. Praise God. <clears throat> so here's what he's doing. He's saying, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Then Nicodemus knows, he knows Numbers 21, that... <clears throat> That Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, on behalf of God, let my people go. Ten plagues come. Eventually, Pharaoh lets them go. They cross over the Red Sea on dry ground. They get to the wilderness. And then, in Numbers 21, the people of God begin to complain. I don't know if you know this, but there was a time back in Bible days when God's people would complain about stuff. Can y'all believe that? And guess what they're complaining about? They're complaining about... God saying yes to their prayer request. God, God heard the cry of his people, please set us free. God says, okay, I will set you free. And then when they get to the desert, they complain about it. Can you believe that some people will complain about the th very thing you prayed for? Anybody ever complain about their job this week? Remember when you were replying, you're like, dear God, please let them pick me. Remember that? He said yes, now we're going to complain about it. You ever complain about your children? Remember, you're like, dear God, just give us a baby. And then he gives you to and you're like, can we return him? I mean, okay? Because church people are different, right? So, so then what happens is the people are complaining to God, so God allows poisonous snakes to come into the camp. 
and to infect the people, to bite the people, and they wake up and they're snake bitten. And the problem is, is, is they've got venom running through their veins, and they come back to God, and they're like, God, we need your help. They go back to Moses, and they're like, hey, tell God we're sorry about the whole complaining thing. We'll get over it. And so the way that God makes, them, makes a way for them to be cured is he tells Moses, Moses, you go take a bronze serpent, which in Hebrew means like poisonous or fiery, and you take that very thing that caused the problem and you lift it up on a pole and whoever will fix their eyes on the serpent that has been lifted up, they will be cured. Because here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is that the same problem that the Israelites had in, in Numbers 21 is the same problem that we have. That we're snake bitten. It's not an external problem. It's an internal problem. And if you have venom running through your veins, it doesn't matter how much ointment you put on the outside. It's not an outside-in thing that's going to make a difference. That you need, a, you need an alien cure. You need to do something on the inside. Even if you kill the snake that bit you, that's not going to do any good. But one of the great loves that your pastor and I have is we love, to, we love to deer hunt. And a few years ago, man, I'm coming out of this deer stand. It had been raining real hard, and I'm... I'm just walking back to my truck on this road, and I, hear, I feel this, like, smack on my foot. And I don't know how much time you spend in the woods. If not, it's half of your problem, but I don't, I don't have time to preach about that. But anyway, I thought my boot had, like, caught a root, and the root just kind of smacked my boot. And so I looked down, and there was a water moccasin hanging on to my snake boots. Now, the Bible says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And what gave me, God gave me that day was a Glock 45. And so I pulled that thing out. <laughs> And I about shot my toes off. <laughs> but eventually I busted that thing right in the top of the head, right? And I held him up. I took him to my deer camp and I strung him up for all of his evil brothers and sisters and cousins to see <laughs> that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath our feet. Understand? Now some people say, well, there's some snakes are good. People, you don't read your Bibles. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but even defeating the enemy that put the poison in you does nothing to take away the poison. Something's got to happen from the inside out. And so what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is, you remember the event where the people were snake bitten. And listen, every single one of us is snake bitten with sin. Sin. And listen, this means that, I, I know the younger you are, the more true this is, but I know your kindergarten teacher told you that you were a snowflake and a rainbow and a skittle. She's a liar. You are a wretched, wretched, depraved sinner. That's what you are, okay? Every single one of us, all right? You know how I know? Me too, man. Me too. Anybody got a toddler here? Did you have to train your child to sin? Or they're just good at it on their own, right? Every single one of us are born like the seagulls out of Nemo, just selfish, going, mine, 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 mine. That's right. That we have us running through our veins. In fact, think about this. This is how sinful we are. Forget God's perfect law. We can't even keep our own laws. We can't even keep our own commandments. How many times have you said, I promise I'll never. Lord, if you get me out of this one, I'll never do this again. You ever pray that twice? Yeah. How's that New Year's resolution working out now that we're in June? Right? What if God only held you accountable to the things you said you were going to do? We'd all fail, man. Nobody's lied to us more than us. And so we need an alien cure, an alien antidote. So what God told Moses to do was hold up that serpent. And whoever would fix their eyes on that serpent, they would be healed. And so now Jesus is with Nicodemus, and he's like, hey, man, that's me. That's me. That God is going to make him who is without sin, that's Jesus, to be sin, that you may become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. That Jesus is going to go to the cross and not only bear our sin, but become our sin. Not only die for us, but die instead of us. And whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The way Galatians says it is this, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So I think at this point, I think Nicodemus, this expert in the Old Testament, Jesus is using his own expertise to unpack the gospel for him. And then the second thing he's going to do is our most popular verse, John 3, 16. And when Jesus says this, he says, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When he begins to say these words, then it all begins to make sense to Nicodemus. In, in, in Hebrew, rabbis would use this thing, it's called protologos. It means first words. So as a Pharisee, you would know all the times in the scripture the words were used first, like the love of a father for a son, sacrifice, gave, all of these kind of things. And the first time these kinds of words are used that we find in John 3, 16, it's found in Genesis chapter 2 describing Abraham and Isaac. And if you're new to Bible study, God picks this man named Abram. His name means father. And not because of anything Abraham had done, but because God is just gracious and good. He goes to Abraham and he says, I want you to pack up your stuff and I want you and your wife to move to a place that I will show you. Now think about this for a second. Abraham, or his name is Abraham at that point, he comes home to his wife Sarah. Sarah, we're moving. Okay, baby, where are we going? God said he would show us when we get there. And then she went with him. You want to talk about faith. I can't get the people with my last name to get in my truck if I don't give them the exact address of where we're going before we get in there. You understand? And she packs up and they go and then God makes a promise to him. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a son. By the way, he's 80 years old when he, when he gets this promise. And he says, I'm going to give you a son, and through your promised son, I'm going to bless all of the world. You're going to have more offspring than the, than the sand on the seashore. Abraham, go, go count the sand at the beach. How much? He's like, it's a lot. You're going to have more kids than that. Go count the stars in the sky. How many stars you got? He's like, I actually think there's more of that than, than sand at the beach. He's like, right. And I promise I am going to, through this promised child, bless the entire world through you. And then Abraham waits and waits and waits and waits and waits. How many of you know that God's timing and my timing ain't exactly the same? He's waiting for 20 years. So if you're praying for something today and God doesn't come through by Tuesday, you might want to give it a minute, okay? And so then what Abraham does, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, they come up with this terrible plan. And, they, and instead of trusting God and his promises, they go and they, they take matters into their own hands. And they try to create a child. And so he sleeps with his handmaiden, Hagar, and they have a son named Ishmael, and Ishmael is the personification of works-based righteousness. Ishmael is the personification of, God, I can't wait on you anymore. I don't trust you to come through on your promises. I've got to do this for myself. And so, Abraham finally does have his son, does have this promised son, the son of his love. His name's Isaac. And then when Isaac is probably a teenager, God comes to Abraham and says, the Bible says that God tests Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only begotten son. I want you to take him up on the mountain, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And the crazy thing is, is that Abraham takes his son, Isaac, up the mountain. And if you have time to read through the account in Genesis chapter 22, what you will see is you will see a picture of the gospel. Here is a father who loves his son, his only begotten son. Here is a son that carries the wood on his back up the hill. And then they get to the top of the hill. And listen, if you grew up in Sunday school and like Veggie Tales and Final, Final Graph and that kind of thing, often we think of Isaac as like a little baby boy, but he's not a little baby boy. He can carry the wood. He can carry on a conversation, which means he's probably, what, like 15, 16 years old, something like that. And when he gets up to the altar, the son willingly lays down on the altar because his dad is like 116 years old. I don't know if you've wrestled a 116-year-old lately, but you got a good shot at winning that one. And so he binds his son up. He raises the knife, Abraham does, to sacrifice his own son. And an angel of the Lord steps in and says, whoa, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. There's a sacrifice. There is a substitutionary sacrifice. And he looks over, and there is a ram, a male lamb with his head stuck in the thorns. You see, that's a miracle. I've been hunting a bunch. You ever walked up on a nice buck, just head stuck in the bushes? Uh-uh. No, no, no. He'd be stuck on my wall after that, but that's a different story, okay? <laughs> and so ultimately what's going on here is that now, now Jesus is using that event as he, as he shares John 3, 16, that, that Nicodemus is all over Abraham, a father's love for his son that was willing to sacrifice him. And the reason that we know Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, we get a little commentary in the book of Hebrews, is that Abraham trusted God. The Bible says that Abraham believed in God and God counted it to him as righteousness. It goes on to say that Abraham was a friend of God. 
And so when Abraham is at the bottom of the mountain, before he goes up on this mountain that he will name Mount Moriah, he looks at his servants and the Bible says that Abraham says, we will go up and worship and we will return. So here's what he knows. Abraham believes that God is who he says he is and he always keeps his promises. And so either he will resurrect his son or there's some other plan that he is yet unaware of. And now Jesus, a couple thousand years later, face to face with this religious man, and he's saying, hey, you, you remember that? You remember that whole account of Abraham and Isaac? And Nicodemus is all dialed in, man. This is like his major. He, this, he's an expert in this kind of stuff. And Jesus is saying, I am that sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave, that he sacrificed his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. He said, for God. God so loved the world, that, that, that God is the one that initiates our salvation, that we're not saved because you finally figured it out on your own, but God has initiated this, and God so loved, that word so, it's an amplifier, that, that whatever word comes after the word so in Greek is to amplify that word, it's to make it bigger, it's to multiply that word. That God just doesn't kind of love you. That God doesn't just sort of love you. That God doesn't just barely love you enough to get you into heaven and forgive you of your sin. But God lavishes love upon his children. Oh, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. You ever see those freaks on the Weather Channel when the hurricanes hit Jacksonville where I live? And everybody's supposed to be not there and they're standing out there? You know, they got the little rain suit in, and the wind and the waves are coming, and the rain, they're like, hey, Ted, this is crazy out here. Y'all should be home, but I'm out here. Woo. That, that's like the lavish love of God. It's not just like a little bit of love. It's not like a one-day-a-week love. It's like love upon love upon love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That word so can also be tra translated this way. This is the way in which God loved you, that he gave, he sacrificed his son. He did not see us down here snake bitten and just pray for us or just hope for the best or hope it worked out. That he gave his only begotten son. The ESV, which is the translation I use, says one and only. But in Greek, the word is monogenus. Monogenus. It means one gene of the same essence. Because Jesus is the second person of the Trinity that he is fully God. And he says, Jesus says to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he's going to sacrifice me, his one and only son, the son of man, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And listen, you know what that whoever means? That whoever means whoever. If you fall into the whoever category, I got some really good news for you. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No matter, and, and again, man, people at our church, we got people from all kind of different backgrounds and, and, and sometimes after the service they'll come up to me and they'll say, Pastor, I know you say whoever believes can be saved, but you don't know what I've done. To which I lovingly say that apparently you don't know what Christ did for you on the cross. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of sin. Sin is a really, really big deal. Sin is such a big deal that it would separate us from God. Sin is such a big deal that Jesus Christ, the perfect spotless lamb of God, had to die on a cross in order for it to be forgiven. However, if you think that you can't be saved because of the things that you have done, I would just tenderly say, who do you think you are? I mean, who do you think you are? I don't know who the worst among us is in the room. Somebody is. One of y'all is the worst, all right? It's probably the guy preaching, if we're honest, all right? But no matter what you've done, who you've done it against, how many times you promised you would never do it again, no matter what it is, all of your sin compared to the grace of God poured out at the cross is like a little tiny flea on the back of an elephant that represents God's love and grace poured out for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him. But listen, <clears throat> Jesus is not talking to a rebel here. He's talking to a religious person. And he's saying, this to, he's saying this to Nicodemus too. So what's just true is this. No matter how bad you are, you are never too far gone 
And no matter how good you are, you need a Savior too. So listen, if you grew up in church, man, I mean, if you grew up Catholic or Baptist or Episcopal or Lutheran, I got good news for you. You can get saved too. You can, man. Sometimes it's harder. It is, because you thought that first communion counted for your salvation, or you thought that RA badge, or you thought that VBS, or you thought your good works were going to save you, and Paul's going to say, no one will be declared righteous. No one will be declared righteous by works of the law. But a righteousness has been manifested apart from the law. This is Jesus Christ who came as the Son of God, fully God and fully man. He lived a perfect life. Then he went to the cross on your behalf. And God made him who was without sin to become sin. That whosoever would believe in him would become the righteousness of God. And when Jesus pushed up on his nail-pierced feet, he says these words. He says, it is finished. In Greek, that word is tetelestai. I have it right here to remind me all the time. Because I'm going to tell you, oftentimes what begins to happen, man, when I preach, I preach all the time, right? I preach all the time. And, and, and the enemy will begin to, begin to give me these whispers. You don't deserve to be up there. If these people knew the stuff you struggle with, if these people knew the things that you have done, if these people knew what a sinner you are, you would be disqualified. And as I'm grabbing on to my podium, I just get to glance down and read this word, tetelestai. It means this, it is finished. In the first century, they have found bank records, and when people would pay off their loan, they would stamp it with this word, tetelestai. It means paid in full. And when Jesus Christ pushed up on his nail-pierced feet and he says, it is finished, that means the debt that we owed for our sin has been paid in full for anyone who would believe that when Christ died on the cross, it counted for them. And so everybody loves John 3, 16, as you should. It's a great verse. But then it keeps going. You always got to keep going. He says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And the native tongue of the enemy is condemnation. To be condemned, condemnation is a building term. It means unfit for use. I know this firsthand. My fraternity house in college, I came home from class one day, and there was a sign on the door, a big sticker, and it said, condemned, unfit for use. And that's what the enemy tries to do for you. He tries to say, because of the things you have done, because of your sin, because of your past, because of, you see, this world wants to label you because then it doesn't have to deal with you. It just deals with the label. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. I did not come to condemn you, but to save you. If the enemy looks at you and says, you're unfit for use, Jesus says, you put your faith in me, and guess what? I'm going to move the Spirit of God inside of you. That what the enemy said was unfit for use is actually the temple of God because God himself, through his Holy Spirit, resides inside of every believer. For God so loved the world. Now, that doesn't just mean the world. That means for God so loved you. For God so loved you. For God so loved you. That he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, pushed up on his nail-pierced feet and says, it is finished. And if you believe, if you trust that that counted for you, then you would not be condemned but that you would have eternal life. I believe, it's a little bit of conjecture, but by the time you get to John chapter 19, Nicodemus shows back up on the scene, takes Jesus' body off the cross and buries it in a tomb. I believe Nicodemus gets to the place where he trusts that he is not saved by his own work, he is saved by the finished work of Christ on the cross. This is why he can touch a dead body on the Sabbath. Because the law does not lord over him anymore, but he has surrendered his life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me just ask you this. Have you ever believed? Have you ever put your faith, your trust, not in your own good works, but have you ever put your trust in Jesus Christ that somehow when he died on the cross, that counted for me? The Bible says the moment you do that, then you are saved. You were saved from the penalty of your sin. You are being saved from the, for the power of sin in your life. And one day we will be saved from the very presence of sin. 